reasoning. I'm actually reading from the screen. Do, do I have a different, is this it? Oh, okay, sounds, it feels a little different. Okay. Um, you're encouraged to speak up to present a line of reasoning, support a position, or to pose or answer a question. Please focus your comments on the applicable guidelines, codes, and statutes, as well as the project at hand. In the interest of time, avoid repeating the comments of others. Applicants shall have a total of 10 minutes to present their case. Unused time may be reserved for rebuttal following at the end of public comments. Um, those who are going to be speaking at the podium, we, we do have a new clock, so <laughs> um, please watch those times as well. A speaker representing a group shall have five minutes to make comments when requested in writing at least one day prior to the meeting date. And these groups would be uh, your neighborhood groups or um, those that have given advance notice. All other members of the public shall have two minutes. I believe. Yes, okay. There we go. Now I see where that uh, is now familiar to me. Pursuant to the provisions of 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via a statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent, independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Okay. First thing on our agenda is the adoption of the January 13, 2022 and January 19, 2022 minutes. Commissioners, do you have any questions on those or is there a motion to approve? Madam Chairman, I move for approval. Okay, there's a motion by the Vice Chair. Second. Second by Commissioner Price. Okay, and all in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay, Aye. none opposed, so that motion carries. I believe we have some changes to the agenda. Ms. Ziegler? Yes, we have quite a few this, this month. 2000 Natchez Trace is pulled from consent, so that'll be at the end of the agenda. 4154 Murfreesboro has been removed. 708 Monroe has been deferred. 2906 Belmont deferred. 1309 Shelby deferred. 200 Broadway deferred. 1109 Petway deferred. So that's um, Q, excuse me, O, Q, R, T, V, W are all deferred. Robin, so 1109 Petway is also deferred? Yes. Okay. Okay, now that we've heard Ms. Ziegler, any questions on that or is there a motion to approve the revised agenda. Madam Chair, I move for approval. Okay, Commissioner Price. Commissioner Williams has seconded. All in favor? Okay, none opposed and that motion carries. And do we have any council members here present? Council member Cash? Outbuildings in the area, and some of the historic outbuildings are smaller in scale for sure. 
we've seen some, some larger ones come in. Some of the some of the outbuildings that, that are in the neighborhood, in the vicinity of this, a lot of them are on, or a number of them are on, like side streets where the, the streets, um, where, where there no or very few houses are fronting the street, like 25th and 26th, where they're kind of short lots with the backs of houses and the alley entrance. Um, Fairfax and Natchez Trace are very different. Most of the houses front Fairfax or Natchez Trace. Uh, I don't know in that vicinity of any uh, large outbuildings that are that are up to the like a ten foot setback. Um, I think so. It, and there are some small um, houses, some like one or one and a half story houses here. So this proposed outbuilding would be like the tower above those. Um, I think there's a safety issue in that the the lot is is next to an alley and the, the you know, diagram shows that the outbuilding is, is you know, backing up to the alley, which is a positive thing, but um, the, the height of it and the closeness to Fairfax, I think, could be a, a, a safety concern and it'll reduce visibility around Fairfax. And Fairfax is a strange street at this, or a, a strange street at this point because there are chicanes, so there, the lanes are kind of shifting as you go down which makes it a little confusing, especially if you aren't used to the street. Um, and so I think kind of reducing the visibility of people coming out of that alley could be problematic. Um, I think that the masking and scale, there are some concerns about the masking and scale of it, while at the same time recognizing that you know the, the property owner has a right to build an outbuilding. Uh, and I think the setback is what's kind of raising the concerns about the masking and scale. Um, there are no issues that I've heard with the addition that's proposed. That is, that is everybody is fine with the setback on that, and the scale, and it's, you know, it, as you can tell, it's done in a quality way by a quality architect. Um, it's, it's mainly centering around the outbuilding and the setback. Um, and so I, I will say, you know, like, no, no issues or objections to the addition. So uh, I know that there are some other folks here that, that want to share their concerns about it from the neighborhood, from the street, and from the neighborhood association. And I, I think there's some discussion that's been started about maybe some changes that are possible. Um, and I, I think for us, we want to find a solution that's win-win for everybody. If there's uh, not that, if we don't find that today on the setback and the outbuilding, uh, like I don't think there's any desire to hold up the addition part of the proposal. Uh, I really appreciate you letting me uh, share my constituents' concerns about this, and uh, hope that you'll uh, ask good questions of the, of the other folks that are going to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other Council Members here? If not, we also thank you for your time and your service to our city. Okay. Onward with the agenda. As notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Um, each case will be read aloud uh, one by one. If you are in opposition of the project, please raise your hand uh, when the case is called out. Uh, items removed from the consent agenda will be heard at the end of the agenda. So for the consent agenda, we have the administrative permits issued for the prior month, 4410 Park Avenue, con new construction of an addition, 2000 Natchez Trace has been removed. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Is there anyone in opposition for 4410 Park Avenue? Please raise your hand now. All right, if there is anyone in opposition to 1200 Russell Street, please raise your hand. 1100 Fort Negley Boulevard rehabilitation. If there's anyone in opposition, please raise your hand. 518 Russell Avenue interior alterations. Um, please let us know if you would like this one heard. 
1107 Montrose Avenue, new construction, addition to an outbuilding with a setback determination. Um, if there is anyone in opposition, uh, please raise your hand. 608 Russell Street, um, violation, that is new construction of an addition with a setback determination. If there is anyone in opposition, please raise your hand. And finally, 1101 Montrose Avenue, new construction of an addition. Uh, if there's anyone in opposition, please raise your hand. Uh, staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda with the applicable conditions, finding that the applications meet the, their respective design guidelines. Um, uh, we're here if you have any questions. Thank you, Melissa. Any questions, commissioners? Just a real quick one for me. Mm -hmm. um, is that a new step asking, uh, you know, can you just give us a little background? It, it's always been a concern. I know when I first started and I went to the first planning commission meeting, it wasn't clear to me when you were supposed to say, hey, I want something off. So we just want to take that extra pause after each one just to make sure mm -hmm. that anyone who wants something to come off the agenda knows this is the time to speak. Thank you, Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Any other questions? On projects. If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Madam Chairman, I so move. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Johnson has also seconded. All in, pra uh, all, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Yes. None opposed. So that motion carries. Thank you. Councilmember Sledge and Broadway Building Group request a historic landmark zoning overlay for the Mary, ba Mary Berry Bass Home on a portion of 915 Kirkwood Avenue. And you'll see that we're just recommending approval of that portion of this much larger lot that has the house on it. It's all going to be subdivided, so it'll just be the one of the new lots. 915 Kirkwood was constructed in 1913 for Mary Berry Bass, a prominent Nashville widow. She hired local architects Asmus and Norton, who were prolific and highly regarded Nashville architects. Um, Christian Asmus, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name, was the supervising architect for 1889 Tennessee Centennial. The house retains its original architectural features and is eligible for listing in the National Register. Finding that the building meets 17.36120B3, staff suggests recommendation of the landmark and adoption of the existing design guidelines to apply to this property. Do you have any questions for me? No, I just like to say I'm, I always love reading these um, histories that y'all put in our packets. Um, this one I, was one I'd, I've passed by, but I didn't know anything about, yeah. and so it was really interesting to Melissa read. Melissa Baldock did all the well, research. Melissa, it was great. I mean, I, I, they're always good ones, but these ones that, you know, I've seen that building, and then you get to read it. It was really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Robin, I have a question. Um, the outbuilding in, in the back? Can you tell us more about that and why it was, how it was determined to? Yes, it does appear to be original to the construction of the house, but it is in very poor shape and is actually condemned at the moment. So based on the condition of it, we decided it wasn't contributing. Um, it also doesn't line up exactly behind the house, so I'm not sure once the subdivision happens, if part of it would be on another lot. And then there are other features on the lot too, the gazebo, a well, and a little shed, but all of those appear to be later. Okay. This is a nice piece of history. Okay. Um, so this would be that we would recommend this. It doesn't say that again, Robin. Oh, okay. Right, right. Please, yeah, you're welcome to come if you if you like. I'm here. I might as well jump on the mic. Dwayne Cuthbertson, uh, 409 Merritt Avenue. I'm here representing the development team. And, you know, I, I don't really have anything to add 
the staff report is pretty thorough, and so we're looking forward to working with Robin and her group on restoring this house and then ultimately developing this large property. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, open public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this project? Okay, if not, we will close public hearing. Commissioners? Any other questions? Is there a motion? Um, see, unless there's any other questions or comments, I'd love to move for approval on 915 Kirkwood Avenue for the historic landmark overlay. Okay, Commissioner Price? Second. Okay, Vice Chair Stewart? All in favor of the motion? Okay, none opposed, so that motion passes. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing the development. So this next one is our first interior landmark. Um, Council Member Withers and Tulip Street Partners have applied for a historic landmark interior for Tulip Street Methodist Church as part of the rezoning of that property for a boutique hotel. And the designation includes some exterior alterations, um, which received an administrative approval, and then there were some interior alterations associated with it that were on the consent agenda. Um, Tulip Street Methodist Church is one of Nashville's most iconic religious structures. The building was listed in the register in 1977, and it's a contributing building in the Edgefield Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Its exterior and interior trim are remarkably intact, especially considering all that it's been through over the years. Um, the, it was completed in 1892. The interior retains its curved form, intricate hand-carved woodwork, and prominent organ on the altar, all of which really make this space very unique to Nashville. So staff suggests the commission recommend approval of 518 Russell. Um, because it is already listed in the National Register, it meets 17.36.120B5 and recommend it, uh, does it um, to, to adopt the existing historic landmark interior guidelines to apply to this property. And as we were talking about before, there's a lot more history in the report as well, which Melissa put together for us. And I believe the applicant should be here for this one. Thank you. Applicant? Good afternoon, <clears throat> Blake Daniels, Daniels Chandler Architects. Uh, we've been working closely with Robin and Melissa on this one. If you've read the history in the report, it is very detailed. And this, this building has been through a lot of history. And the hope is to be able to give the opportunity for the public to come in and start enjoying it again. It's been, it's been concealed and closed up for probably 10 or 15 years, only for private, private ceremonies and things like that. So getting to see the woodwork and the detailing of this building that was built so long ago, pre, pre power tools is, is an exciting structure. So thank you. Yes. Preservationist. Thank you as well. Open public hearing. Anyone else would like to comment nicely on this project? Okay. Thank you. Close public hearing. Uh, Madam Chairman, it is so great to see this structure saved and the structure has been there, but to have this with the intent of opening it to the public so people can appreciate the, the history of this project is, is wonderful. So I applaud the applicant and, and with that, uh, I move for uh, approval of this recommendation. Thank you, Vice Chair. Second. Commissioner Jones has seconded. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay. I'm sure none opposed. <laughs> So this motion passes. Thank you again. I'm going to take that off if that's all right. All right. Uh, 1301 Second Avenue North, uh, demolition and uh, new construction. The demolition is of a metal industrial building construct, constructed circa 1960. Uh, the building is not historic and demolition meets the design guidelines. The lot is at the far eastern edge of the overlay at the corner of 2nd Avenue North and Monroe Streets. 
the new building will be constructed to the build two lines uh, at the inside edge of the sidewalks of both streets uh, after sidewalk improvement and the building will have a five foot rear setback and a five foot setback from the adjacent parcel to the north. These setbacks are appropriate for mid-rise buildings and meet the applicable design guidelines. Um, and just to remind you, this is an SP application uh, part one, so we're only reviewing uh, setback scale and massing, uh, not details that will be reviewed uh, at a second time through. Um, just across the street from, uh, or bo across both streets from this parcel, uh, which would be outside the overlay, are several mixed use and multi-story developments at various stages of completion, uh, which will have as many as six or seven stories. The guidelines for the subject property allow up to two stories with a height of 30 feet for a flat roofed building. Uh, given the heights of the adjacent context um, and how much difference there is between inside and outside the overlay, staff finds that holding the infill to two stories which is what the guidelines would require here, or the most that they would allow, that that would create an abrupt transition into the historic neighborhood. And for that reason, we're supportive of additional height uh, for a more gradual transition. Uh, the proposal is for a multi-story building with two, com two major components, one being a five-story uh, facade with a six-story stepped back from all four sides, and the other uh, having a two-story facade. The larger component on the southern portion of the lot will be 61 feet tall with the sixth story, uh, which is stepped back, as I said, uh, the sixth story rising up to 65 feet tall. Uh, staff finds that the additional height uh, beyond what is permitted by the design guidelines is appropriate um, with a condition that the infill is no more than five stories and no more than twice the height permitted by the guidelines. Uh, so that would be five stories uh, with a maximum of 60 feet. Uh, also on the northern portion of the building uh, where it does transition uh, into the interior of the neighborhood, staff recommends no more than uh, two stories and 30 feet tall, which is what the guidelines currently allow. Uh, staff finds the articulation and orientation of this facade to be appropriate. Um, although the context across the streets outside the overlay uh, includes many large buildings, there are uh, the historic context on this block is is one story uh, historic houses. So staff finds that having that transition is appropriate uh, is uh, an important. Uh, component of this design or for this design. On the Monroe Street elevation, staff found the orientation to be appropriate. Uh, the guidelines require facades to be articulated such that the unbroken facade does not exceed the height of the building. And uh, to that, staff recommends additional articulation there to break up that street facing facade. Um, to the rear, uh, which is an alley facing elevation, staff finds this to be appropriate. Um, the orientation uh, faces uh, the alley at the rear. Uh, staff finds that additional articulation is not needed here because it's rear facing and because the upper story massing is stepped back from that uh, first and second story. And then around to the north elevation, um, again, staff finds that the upper story uh, uh, does not need additional articulation because the, the upper story component is stepped back from the, uh, the one story component. Uh, in the, the one story section, there is a rooftop deck. Rooftop decks in this zone of the overlay are permitted on infill uh, when sitting back from a street facing wall and staff finds that this meets that condition or it meets that guideline. Uh, and back to uh, the discussion of the front elevation, I mentioned that uh, the the two-story component on the north portion of the of the building, uh, or it should have a no more than two stories and a height of no more than thirty feet. So that applies to this facade as well. Uh, staff recommends approval of the demolition of the non-contributing, and approval of the scale and massing of the proposed infill with 
the conditions that the infill is no more than five stories on the southern portion, uh, up to 60 feet, and two stories no taller than 30 feet tall on the northern portion, that the upper story section on the Monroe Street facade is uh, more articulated, and that if the SP is approved by the Planning Commission, that the applicant return to you for review of materials, colors, textures, windows, doors, etc. Uh, and with those conditions, staff finds that this meets the, or will meet the Germantown Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay Guidelines. Thank you, um, Sean. I can answer any questions, or try to, but uh, okay. the architect is here and they certainly can answer questions. Sure. Applicant, would you like to come forward? I'm going to put in there PowerPoint if you're uh, give me a moment. Great, thank you. Red means on, right? <laughs> good, good afternoon, rather. Uh, commissioners, thank you for having me. I'm Scott Morton with Smith G Studio, uh, 602 Taylor Street in Germantown. Uh, it's a pleasure finally being here. Um, we have worked with the property owner who is in attendance today for the subject property and the proposed development um, for the boutique hotel since 2020, and so we've gone through a very robust um, process of design and engagement with the community starting in 2020, um, of exploring the context of this unique site in the district, as well as understanding and listening to the community's thoughts and perspectives related to it. Um, we've had significant discussions with the Germantown Historic Neighborhood Association uh, we've hosted three meetings most recently for updates uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we have gotten tremendous support from the Councilman uh, O'Connell, as well as many of the neighborhood leaders and uh, community members. We have gotten a lot of great input in the design and the quality of the, co the development from the community, which we have made significant revisions through this process and ultimately has created uh, a better project and the most appropriate uh, design for this location to handle, to accommodate the objectives of the neighborhood. Primarily, uh, what I wanted to focus on today was just the unique characteristics and how this project will serve as a community benefit to um, setting a precedent for its edges. When we started looking at this project, it was, it was at this corner with this uh, non-contributing historic our non-contributing uh, industrial building. We knew that it was unique in the sense that it's right at the southeast corner of the overlay district. And probably the most unique characteristic is what many call the river district or the Newhoff district that kind of surrounds this corner on all, all three other corners have um, either under construction built or uh, starting construction, very significant mid-rise structures varying in height from five to seven stories. And so this precedent of height at this corner has been set on three quarters of the intersection. And we said, well, how do we make this fit in the context of not only the community and the neighborhood's historic components to the north and west, but also how do we make it transition and serve as a transitional component to the higher density and a more intense development on the, along the intersection. And so this began the journey of looking at the massing and the composition in different ways and having a lot of different communication with staff, with uh, the community on how to accomplish those goals. And primarily what we've ended up with is concentrating our height at a, uh, appropriate scale to the taller buildings around it at the intersection of Monroe and Second to the five-story massing, whereas across the street we have a seven-story building, a five-story building, and a six-story building, all of which we will be uh, smaller in height to the, the three larger projects around us, but consistent in the character and context of the massings around us. Furthermore, as we transition to the north and to the west, we've taken careful consideration of both the the fenestration of the building, but also stepping down the height strategically. Uh, to the north, for example, we are stepping down to what appears in the final product, which I'll share in a moment, as a two-story volume and within 30 feet on that northern facade. What this does is two things, is not only does the transition occur completely within this site, but it also establishes a precedent 
for future development on the north uh, to be consistent with the scale of our edges. And so by being deliberate and, and setting our edges appropriately, we are putting into place the uh, appropriate uh, norms for or the expectations of heightened massing for future projects in the district uh, as they transition from this corner. Uh, likewise, on the western facade of the alley frontage, um, similar approach, we've stepped down to a two-story massing along the alley so that if anything uh, is developed further in the future, it will uh, have to be consistent with that massing. The other unique aspect of the site is that it is, sits low, lower than 3rd Avenue. So 3rd Avenue is just to our west. This is 2nd Avenue. We're approximately, depending on where you measure, 15 to 20 feet in elevation lower than 3rd Avenue. And so that is taken into consideration when it comes to the massing and how it relates to the heart of the community, which is further west on 3rd Avenue at a, a much loftier um, elevation than the Second Avenue sites in general. Um, could you advance a few slides, please? Uh, I wanted to just share a little bit about some of the background. Next slide, please. Here in this exhibit, you can see some of that described context with buildings. Um, the site is in yellow in the center of the page. And you can see projects 7, which is a seven-story building under construction currently, project can't read that far. 10 uh, is the five-story building with roof form of lifestyle communities that is, com is completed and occupied. And number nine is the new Hoff phase two development, which is a six-story uh, residential building right across the street on 2nd Avenue. You can also see to our north the non-contributing neighbor in red uh, with the lot next door, which we're transitioning towards for future development on that lot would be consistent with, with our site. Next slide. Uh oh. No, there's no videos. Uh, um, you know, an important aspect of our process of meeting early with the neighborhood and obviously being in the neighborhood as uh, a, uh, an office tenant in the community, um, we have a, a, a long and, and very strong relationship with the Germantown Neighborhood Association. We knew that taking architectural cues from the history of the architecture and, and um, being responsive to that and respecting the past was going to be important. But how do we make that consistent in a modern template? And so we began to explore a lot of precedents. Next slide, please. Uh, different volumes and forms, both in the, the historic and new construction, to understand what can honor the past but also reflect the modern um, direction of development in this kind of warehouse district along 2nd Avenue. Next, please. Then we started looking at historic models of breaking down transition. So looking at the historic proportions of buildings and how we can begin to break up the massing in different volumes. So you can see such as the building on the left with, uh, while it's one building, it creates the fenestration of multiple facades uh, and pedestrian scale architecture on the street facing frontages of the building. Next slide, please. And then lastly, you know, with historic proportions, um, and quality architecture materials, we can still create a more modern uh, palette and outcome that would respect the past in simple forms. And by using these simple, uh, proven, and timeless uh, strategies, we think we can really blend the style to, to be something very attractive for the community. Next slide. Engagement at the street level, uh, next slide, is extremely important. Uh, uh, the aspect of indoor and outdoor atmosphere or environment at this location is extremely important. We have uh, the opportunity for commercial spaces with coffee shop and restaurant on the ground floor that will have these large open French doors that can have more of a, a French bistro type of experience, a sidewalk cafe, uh, something that has really high quality architecture on the ground floor fenestration that the residents will uh, really enjoy, as well as the improvements on the sidewalks and new street trees uh, to improve pedestrian mobility in the district. Next slide. Next, next. Next, please. A few more images of the context. This, this section right here is, I think, a good demonstration of the, the topography I talked about. The Monroe Apartments, as you see on the top left of the page, is the Third Avenue, which is higher in elevation than the proposed site. 
uh, then drops down to Second Avenue, and then obviously development increases in intensity as it goes to the river uh, and the Newhoff complex. This is actually our proposal that is before you today is uh, actually two stories lower than what's shown there in that exhibit that was not updated from previous um, previous exercises. So what we presented, next slide please, what we previously presented to the community uh, as a starting point to begin the conversation was two stories taller than where we are today. Um, we went to the community and we talked about the transitions, we talked about the overall height. We came back to the community two months later with a reduced plan. Uh, we reduced the height, both in overall height and made the transition smaller in height as well. The community was extremely supportive of the changes we provided. At that point, we felt we had enough to begin to talk to Metro Historic, and they gave us further direction, which we then revised the plan further, reduced the height even further after those conversations and review, uh, and ultimately to the presentation to today before you. I've run out of time, so I will just end with, um, we've greatly appreciated all the input, and we do believe it's a great project. The one aspect of the proposal in front of you today that we would like to discuss and, and uh, have your consideration on is the rooftop, um, the penthouse amenity space is considered a uh, secondary form that step back. The idea is that that form on the rooftop is only four feet taller than the parapet. It would be in the form of a, an outdoor amenity for the patrons of the building, and it will be set back to a point that it will not be visible from, from view, and it'll be a lot of glass and dark material. So we feel like we can mitigate the design of that to reduce its visual impact on the property, and would love for that to be considered today as an option. So thank you very much. And happy thank you. Questions. Appreciate that presentation. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Commissioners. I have a question for staff about 60 feet and five stories. Um, that's an average of 12 feet per story. I don't know if the applicant and the applicant may be able to speak to this. I think a little bit more on the first floor would get you down in the 13, uh, excuse me, the 11. Ten and a half range on the floor to floor for a hotel. I think it's doable, but it's certainly getting really tight. And, and I wonder if I just want some clarity on where we're measuring the 60 feet to and from, and whether some um, having a taller first floor, which seems appropriate with the sloping site, would be of consideration. Uh, I'll go first, and then you can. Elaborate. Uh, well, we were thinking the the sixty the zero for our, our measurement uh, is is sidewalk grade at at the front on the Second Avenue facade. It it does obviously slope up, going up uh, west up Monroe, um, but it's a yeah. So from from sidewalk floor level at sidewalk grade essentially, um, it's nearly a twenty foot first story as it's expressed on the exterior, but there's a mezzanine inside, so it's, I'm not sure how that complicates the, the layout for the client, uh, for the applicant. And Mr. Mosley, just to clarify, the, the floor to floor dimension for the hotel is actually a standard dimension of nine feet floor to floor mm -hmm. for okay. the hotel levels. Uh, the ground floor is 20 feet in height, which is both for not only to have the taller ceilings and the better fenestration on the, the facade, but also in the back of the building, there is a mezzanine level for some back of house operations that are built into the building in the back. So it will be a tall ceiling on the street side, but it will have a, a small mezzanine for some back of house operations internally. And so again, just for clarity, the mezzanine is not a, it's a mezzanine, it's not a floor. Correct. Uh, in, in terms of what we're the mezzanine does not extend to the Second Avenue facade, if that helps. It does. And so in the staff's um, recommendations in the, the rooftop amenity, can I, I can't, my eyes aren't that good, and I get the, uh, the pleasure of the screen that challenges my vision. It's like wearing 3D glasses without a 3D thing over here. So <laughs> it doesn't work is what I'm trying to say. And so I'm trying to read that far. Is it 68, or what, what's the top of the roof on the um, uh, amenity level? It's 65, 65 and okay. so it's 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 four feet above the top of parapet for the building, the main building facade. Got it. Thank you for clarity. Uh, 
I have a question for um, for staff or for Robin. Did we receive any other public comment? I saw one letter. I know the Germantown Neighborhood Association is very vocal, so I was just surprised not to see any other comment or anybody present today. So, no, we only received the one in opposition. I've got a question for Sean. Could you explain um, or elaborate on his request about that amenity deck and what's currently approved and what he wants changed? So, I mean, our starting point for reviewing something is the design guidelines. And the, gui the design guidelines limit infill to two stories at, and 30 feet tall. Um, as I said, that, you know, looking at the context, and, and those guidelines were sort of written before Germantown became the Germantown it is today. We, I don't think some of those seven and, and however many tall stories buildings were really, anybody thought that was coming in 2008 when the guideline, when the overlay w went into effect. Um, so we realized that the, that 30 feet, which is a newer guideline, but 30 feet was, was would create a, a jarring contrast from in and out, just from across the street. Um, and so, but I mean, the, we didn't really know exactly what the magic number is, but trying to tie it to the guidelines, we thought, well, <laughs> um, twice the guideline uh, allotment of, of 30 feet to, to allow 60, is that a reasonable number? Um, because, you know, if the building across the street were three stories or four stories, I don't think we would have been, been that, um, going that far beyond the, the guideline. Is that, I mean, the starting point being 30 feet, uh, 60 seemed like logical uh, place to start for, for our recommendation, but obviously the client isn't, they're asking for a little bit more, and that's where you come in. How much more are they asking for? Uh, f five feet more. Five feet more. Step back. Step back. It is, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sean. All right. Like this project, I think it, you know staff did a really great explanation. I really appreciate the uh, detailed analysis. I understand this uh, parcel or, or this area is uh, mid-rise two to four according to the guideline. However, you know uh, because of the uh, site uh, unique uh, topography. Even though it's going to be a uh, five-story, but it will actually within 60 feet. I mean, uh, some building with a tall ceiling, if it's uh, 15 feet each floor, it can be, you know, 60 feet building with four stories. So in that sense, I think this is very well thought plan, and especially this is SP, so that is really giving a flexibility with the design guideline. And I'm especially appreciative of the 30 feet uh, transition portion because that will set transition to existing uh, one story, two story, you know, uh, historical structure. So overall, uh, I think uh, this is a great uh, project and I'm very uh, appreciative of uh, the development, uh, you know, thoughtfulness, and I'm uh, totally in support. I think to piggyback on Commissioner um, Johnson, I live in this area, so I get, I get, <laughs> I get the development. Um, the workings of how you've transitioned and been sensitive. It's difficult to be sensitive to the historic, especially if it's not five to six and seven stories. Um, so I, I lean to that, that agreement that you've done a, a really good job on, on making this transition um, and keeping with historic guidelines. That's really difficult uh, in this area. But I think you've been, it looks like you're sensitive to that historic context, and that's really important. Uh, Madam Chairman, with uh, with respect to this project, I think that uh, 
It, it is a sensitively designed project. It does respect uh, both the newer and older buildings and try to transition between those two. Uh, I feel like, you know, the detailing, the activation at the street seems like it'll be a healthy addition to, to this neighborhood. Um, I, I think, as Sean said, you know, what's the magic number? <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, given the transition in this community over the years. Uh, you know, I think this is well thought out. To me, uh, I'm not bothered by the additional five feet as it's set back from the, from the front face of the building. Uh, so, um, uh, unless there are other comments uh, with respect to this project, I, I would uh, move that we move for approval uh, of the application as submitted. Okay, Vice Chair. Okay, Commissioner Johnson is a second. And all in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, thank you. I'm sure we'll see you again because it's going to planning, so yes, we will absolutely. look forward to the rest. Thank, thank you. you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, owner. Could I ask for one clarification? Um, so I assume that means conditions one and two are not a part of it, but is three still a condition? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Well, and, and am I am I able to make a comment? I mean, after the vote. Yeah, sure. Just I know the one the one uh, letter in opposition was um, about zoning, and I just want to make that clear to the public that that is not under our purview. That is, um, um, we are just reviewing the massing scale and massing of the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. Duly noted. Okay. Next up is 1308 Forest. The commission approved an addition at 1308 Forest in December and disapproved a two-story, 17-foot outbuilding in January. The applicant has now revised the outbuilding. The outbuilding has a modern design and form that correspond with the design of the addition. The materials need final staff review. The applicant is proposing to connect the outbuilding to the house using steel girders. Staff finds that both the connector and the steel material are not appropriate as they are not compatible with the historic house or the context. Staff finds that if the project is evaluated as an addition, it does not meet the design guidelines, either for design, because the steel girders connecting two massings is not a historic form, nor does it meet the guidelines for massing, as the previously approved addition is already large and the new revision would add even more massing connected to the back of this modest house. If viewed as an outbuilding, staff finds that the proposal could meet the design guidelines. The steel girders would need to be removed to fully separate the house from the outbuilding. If this were done, then the outbuilding meets the guidelines for height, square footage, and setbacks. The only remaining issue is the distance between the structures. The guidelines require 20 feet between primary buildings and outbuildings. The proposal shows 10 feet of distance. Staff finds that the 10 feet could be appropriate in this case, as the footprint of the outbuilding is modest at around 700 square feet compared to the 1,000 square feet that could be allowed on this lot. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed outbuilding with the following conditions. One, that the steel girders connecting the outbuilding to the house shall be removed, and two, that staff shall approve the final materials. With these conditions, staff finds that the proposed outbuilding meets the design guidelines. Questions for me? The applicant is here and would like to speak. Thank you, Jenny. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here again. Uh, my name is Matt Schutz, and I live at 1525 Hillsborough Pike. Um, and I, again, want to thank the owners, Andy and Janelle Muma, um, each ama amazing designers in their own right, um, as well as staff and Jenny Warren, I have appreciated her time, her expertise, her professionalism, even in those moments where we might uh, differ in academic opinion. Um, last month, the, the MHCC voted to disapprove our proposal for a modern accessory wing to a previously approved addition at 1308 Forest Avenue. Uh, a primary issue was the applicability and definition of the term one story, uh, and we felt like commissioners offered some comments to indicate that a shorter accessory wing might be uh, or would be preferable. After the January meeting, we met with staff to discuss ways that the modern accessory wing could be dug farther into the ground, as well as other construction details that might make staff approval or approval with conditions more likely. In today's proposal, you'll see that we lowered the front roof height from 16 feet to 12 feet and increased the site setback from, 
I'm sorry, side setback from eight feet to 10 feet. We also removed any decking and uh, any railings atop the steel connecting beams. The accessory wing was designed to meet the guidelines for rear additions that extend to be wider than the historic building. I'm um, in that section 6B4 on page 26 of the guidelines. And we put an analysis of that on the very last page of the packet that we presented or submitted. Um, additionally, the proposed accessory wing was designed to respond and be compatible with nearby outbuildings. It's less than 55, I'm sorry, it's 55% less massive by volume than the outbuilding next door at 1218 Forest. And it's also 40% less massive than the outbuilding across the alley at 1309 Woodland Street. Uh, scale is something we really wanted to get right. Um, uh, and even though the overall proposal is just under double the footprint of the existing house, it remains consistent with the historic property next door and black averages at around 20%, I'm sorry, 27% building coverage. Uh, metal and steel are evident in historic districts, um, not always in obvious ways, but they're in roofing and railings, sometimes cast iron columns and decorative elements or brackets, as well as exposed and hidden reinforcement elements. Our incorporation of steel first serves the purpose of structural redundancy uh, to resist the very real chance of future high wind events. The seal also helps to visually reinforce the boundary of the open courtyard and create a ceremonial gateway into that space. Uh, all that being said, <laughs> in my last conversation with the owners, they said they're willing to quote um, 86 the steel if that's something necessary for approval, um, which, I, which I liked because that's, <laughs> that's kind of their uh, industry jargon. Um, I, thank you again for your consideration. Um, I'll uh, briefly explain the, the model I brought and I'm happy to answer questions with the remainder of my time. So again, we have <laughs> the massing model from uh, weeks past. Uh, on top, we have a traditional 1,000 square foot uh, accessory structure, that type of massing, and I'll put that to the side. And underneath is the new, newly proposed um, accessory wing with those steel connectors. Um, the most important one to us is this little one that attaches the floating boxes. Because um, obviously, you may want them floating visually, but structurally you want them <laughs> well anchored. Um, there's also over here is the is little piece of the model from last month's proposal. So if you'd like to, you can remove one and kind of compare the others. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Mr. Schutz. OK, open public hearing. Anyone here speak of? Close public hearing. Give ourselves a little time to see the uh, model or have any questions. Jenny? So the, the only, uh, or not the only, but the difference uh, of the, the new information that we're getting here is, can you just reiterate that? So this month's design is shorter, so the height meets the design guidelines, and it was connected fully with the deck, and now it's just those steel girders. Um, we, we're requesting that those be, or we're recommending that those girders be removed entirely. Um, but the height does now meet the guidelines. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Chair, uh, question to Jenny. So, my understanding is uh, the steel gutter, the uh, material is not appropriate in the history content, correct? Correct. The material we didn't feel was appropriate, and also connecting in that manner is not something that you would have seen, or it's not something you do see in that context at all. So, in that context, uh, if the steel gutter uh, changed to like a pagola type of, uh, you know, wood, historical appropriate material, but connection itself is not appropriate. Correct. Thank you. The, co the connection itself is still a problem. Right. Yes. yes. Okay. So yeah. if I may ask uh, the uh, applicant, uh, Mr. Schultz, 
I think you mentioned the steel gutter in the structurally. So you are not telling us without steel gutter that a building does not exist by itself? I, I don't know if I'm... Or structurally unsafe. You are not suggesting that. Um, we think it's, <laughs> um, you know, with, with anything involving design, um, it, there may not always be a yes and no answer. I think if, if the commission today si decides that um, those steel elements are too much and they don't feel comfortable with those elements, we'll, we'll go back to the, uh, I'm, the proverbial drawing board. We'll go back and we'll analyze the structural. We'll probably talk with the structural engineer. We'll definitely make it work. Um, uh, at the same time, the reason we, we created that structural connection was because we felt it did give it some more stability um, and, uh, and felt even doing so, we were still in the, within the guidelines for an addition that swings wider than the uh, historic house at the back of the lot. Um, but no, if, if, you guys, if you guys feel that those, that steel connection is inappropriate, it doesn't mean that the whole project is dead, it means that we, go back and we reanalyze and we, <laughs> these are design skills to make sure that it is safe. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make it sure because I hate to see uh, that a building will not withstand without still building that will be unsafe. And thank you for the clarification. So let's reiterate that. Jenny, you did say it would be the connector that's not within the guidelines. Whether it's structural or not, that's not within the guidelines. Correct. We found that method of connecting was not appropriate to the context. Commissioner Johnson, did you get that one? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure we were really clear that whether it's wood or whether it's another material other than steel, that is not within the guidelines. Okay. Or context. Thank you. Um, I think we're in discussion now. Yes, Commissioner Bill? Sorry. We're in, but the public hearing is closed. Are we in discussion now? Or? Yeah, we, we, I think I closed public hearing. I, I think so, too. Um, Th thank you, Commissioner. No, yeah, just making sure. Um, um, I, I agree with staff's um, analysis on, on this project in condition one. I think, you know, an outbuilding is an outbuilding. And as we've reviewed uh, projects, not necessarily in this district, but in other districts that were adamant that a connector was necessary for convenience or for architectural flair or whatever reason, um, stability, I, I think an outbuilding should stand on its own. And, and in this case, I, I agree with the staff's uh, analysis and recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner. Architects, you have any other comments? Yeah, I appreciate the applicant and um, Mr. Schutz is uh, working with Jenny on this. Um, you know, from the beginning, I think the staff analysis ever since the, we approved the addition, has been right on. I think that this one is also correct. Uh, following on what Ben just said, we've, I can remember at least three times we've denied connectors on outbuildings, and I, I think that that's a good uh, track record that we should continue and not start down any kind of slippery slopes when it comes to this sort of issue. So I also agree with the staff and Jenny's work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, Chairwoman, I, uh, with respect to 1308 Forest Avenue, I move for approval with staff conditions. Thank you, Vice Chair Stewart's made a motion. Is there a second? Okay. Commissioner Lee has made Williams. Um, all in favor of the motion? Okay. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you. The next item is 111 Broadway, a circa 1929 industrial and commercial building that contributes to the historic character of the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. The historic structure is three stories tall with a roof rooftop addition that was approved by MHCC in about 2007 and constructed shortly thereafter. In December 2021, MHCC staff issued an administrative permit for the alteration of the ground floor storefront. None of the existing storefront windows are original or in place right now. 
as seen here in the photos from the 1980s and 1990s. Under the December permit, the applicant was permitted to install a nano wall system, which was, has been approved in the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay in the past. After all, after approval, the applicant found that a nano wall system cannot be easily installed in the storefront because the interior configuration of the front wall columns, so this kind of those columns that bend back, make it difficult to install the nano walls. So the applicant is requesting the use of the Chicago bifold window. Um, this, in when, this image here shows what they look like when they are closed. Um, there won't be a transom because these don't have arched, you know, the, the building in question doesn't have an arched um, opening, but so just the, the bottom part of that. Uh, so here are more images of um, the windows either partially open or fully open. They do, um, the window elements are fully inside the storefront when open, so nothing's going out over the sidewalk. So uh, in its review of operable storefront windows in the past, MHCC has found that nano walls were appropriate because when closed, their butt joints produce a look where the seams are minimal and the overall look is of a large glass pane. Folding windows like the Chicago bifolds have not been approved um, in the past for the ground floor because their thick mullions when, cl when closed do not produce that overall look of a storefront window. Um, but that said here... Um, Staff found that the Chicago bifold windows could be appropriate because this building um, at 111 Broadway is an industrial type building. It never had a traditional storefront with the you know large plane glass, large pane glass windows, uh, and um, you can see the existing windows um, kind of look like the Chicago bifold system now. So we thought for this instance, for this ground floor, for this storefront, they are approvable here. Um, the applicant is also proposing a projecting sign. The sign meets the design guidelines, except that it is 20 feet tall, um, whereas the design guidelines says that for two- and three-story structures, uh, projecting signs should only be 16 feet. Um, and the design guidelines also do say that, um, so here's another picture of the, um, of the proposed um, projecting sign. Uh, in the design guidelines, it does clearly state that in determination of numbers of stories of a building, the rooftop addition should not be considered within the number of stories. So historically, this was a three-story building, so staff finds that the design guidelines for two- and three-story buildings, which say that the um, sign should be no taller than 16 feet, should be met. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval with a condition that the sign be no taller than 16 feet, uh, that the existing projecting sign be removed prior to the installation of the new sign, and that MHCC approve the signage prior to it being installed. Happy to answer any questions, and the applicants are here. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, thank you. Steph, um, I know you said this, but I want to reiterate it again, that the recommendation um, that the Chicago-style windows are appropriate for, for this building and this building only because of its nature and the type of building that it is. And exactly. It's state of construction and didn't never had a traditional storefront. I don't want to say that it's not appropriate anywhere else, but for most buildings with the traditional would storefronts, it would not be appropriate. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. For the record. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Applicant. Oh, I have a question. Oh, to the, oh sorry. To staff. Sorry, Commissioner. Um, wait. Do you want to wait till discussion? Or um, when I consider this this corner and, and the Second Avenue Broadway to be one of the most important corners in Nashville, and um, it's always bothered me when I've driven down and I've seen that big LED light that advertises the Glen Campbell Museum, and it's. Um, do we have any purview over that? We did issue a permit for that sign. Um, I don't remember. It's been within the last two, I want to say it's early 2020, where we issued a permit for that sign. And at that point, found that it um, met the design guidelines in terms of its size, location, illumination. And so that bright LED uh, light is, if it, is, is, it the one, is it the one that you see here um, in the picture? At uh, go to the next, the next picture. Show it's. I don't think maybe you know what what I'm that one right there. Yes, you that see that is. yellow? Oh, the one inside the window. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. We don't have any purview over anything that happens on the interior. So anything that's inside the glass, we don't have any purview over approving or disapproving or reviewing. Okay. 
Okay, well, that, that sign has always been pretty garish yeah. to me. And I'm, um, anyway. But I'm yeah, I thought you meant the sign below it on the wall, which we did approve. Right, um, right. But yeah, okay. but yeah we, we don't have any purview over anything on the interior. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Stanton. I work at Remick Architecture, and we're representing our client for 111 Broadway. Um, as mentioned, we currently have a, stack, a staff recommendation, which is approval of storefront windows, which we thank you for your team and agree that that would be a good option for us, um, but the sign to be no taller than 16 feet high. Um, we're requesting a 20-foot sign and just kind of going over the modifications for exceptional design on page 54 of the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Um, architecturally, the building is very nondescript. The proposed sign would not take away from any of the features or the historic representations. Um, the client is also willing to forego any blade signs on 2nd Avenue if we include the additional 20 square feet to the Broadway facing blade sign. With the, and we understand that typically a rooftop structure is not considered a fourth story, but when you're on 2nd Avenue looking down towards the river, because the rooftop structure is flush with the facade of the building on 2nd Avenue, it really does read as a four story. Um, so, with that said, a 20-foot sign would look more proportionate. Um, a 20-foot sign would not only be more in scale with the building, but more consistent with the character of signage in the Broadway Entertainment District from 1st to 5th Avenue. Because the, 11, the 111 Broadway is located near the river, a larger sign would be more visible from the top of Broadway and attract more people towards the Whiskey River Saloon and surrounding businesses. There are currently a few streetlight structures which interrupt the visibility of the 16-foot sign and we feel that the four-foot addition would really assist in the visibility. Um, we are working with Jocelyn Sign, who is known for creating reputable quality signs, many which are located on Broadway and have been approved by Historic Commission. Um, and as you see, these are the Jocelyn Sign drawings. Um, so thank you for your consideration. Um, I'm sorry, did you, did you, your presentation was ended. <laughs> your voice is a little low. Was your presentation ending? Yes. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Sean Henry, 511th Avenue North. Uh, I represent the Kelly Investment Group. Mr. Kelly's here. He's, he's flown in from California to be with you today. He can answer any questions, you know, related to his business operation here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as, as Caitlin pointed out, on page 54 of your Broadway sign uh, provisions, you've got uh, criteria for considering modifications to the sign regulations. And... If we could go to the other slide uh, here, the other photograph, that one. As she was commenting about the, really the scale of this building, you can see how long that wall is on, on 2nd Avenue, and of course it's, it's almost as long on Broadway. It's probably, from, from a footprint standpoint, we're looking at a building that has about a 15,000 square foot footprint and the floor plates above it. Uh, it's one of the largest, uh, if, if not the largest, footprints on Broadway. It's a very, very large industrial building. And we would submit that, you know, the way this building reads, particularly from this angle in that corner, that, that rooftop addition is flush along 2nd Avenue. It's certainly pushed back from Broadway. Um, we think the scale of this sign, presently the sign is 16 feet, and it's, it's not in scale and proportion with the windows on the second and third floors. The idea here is by adding an additional four feet to the height of that sign, it allows that sign to get more proportional to the corner. And this is a blade sign that is running perpendicular to Broadway. It's not, it's not a sign mounted on the corner. It's not oriented to Second Avenue in any way. Its orientation is completely on Broadway. Uh, and as was mentioned, this is sort of the edge of the, of the Broadway Entertainment District coming from, from first to fifth. Uh, so we think it, it improves the scale of the sign and the appearance of the sign relative to the building itself. Uh, there's one square foot of allotment that's available on Broadway, and there's, according to the staff report, there's 74 
square feet of sign, unused sign allotment on 2nd Avenue. Essentially what we're asking, if, if you would consider it this way, uh, we're talking about 20 square feet. Going up another four feet is 20 square feet. What we're proposing is that we transfer 20 square feet of the 74 square feet that's unused on 2nd Avenue, and let's put it on the Broadway side in this additional uh, sign height. So if that, if that helps sort of you know, put, put, a, put a figure to it, that's essentially what we're asking for here is a transfer of 19 square feet. We have one on Broadway, a 20 square feet addition in that four foot additional height. Again, we think it's more to scale. Um, and your criteria, we think, as, as, has, been, uh, as, as has been stated, we think it, it makes better sense to have the sign in a, in a more proportional position on the building itself. So we're happy to answer any questions. We appreciate your courtesies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Anyone else from your team? We're good for now. Okay. Open public hearing. Closed public hearing. Commissioner Mosley, I've closed public hearing. Okay, commissioners. Would it be proper for us to hear from the property owner about what he plans to do with the building? Or, I mean, I'm excited to, to see sure. and hear from him. Um, and he's dri he's flown all the way from California to see us. How many yeah, how many more minutes do they have? I think we cleared that, but I I, I did ask for minutes. Um, commissioners, are you okay with this? Of course. Sure. You're welcome to come up, please. Welcome. Hey, guys. Um, I'm Michael Kelly. And don't hold it against me that I flew in from California. No. I've got a 12-year-old daughter who's holding me ransom. She won't let me move here yet. <laughs> uh, we're trying. Um, I also own the Lucky Bastard Saloon, uh, which is at 4th and Broadway. Super excited about this project. I don't own the building, but I did purchase the lease from Rock Bottom and then uh, went into a new lease with the property owner who's out of Baltimore. Um, the, the building, it's a big building. It's really kind of an industrial building. And I agree with you. The signs in the windows are terrible. Uh, I've talked to Rick at the museum. We've asked about trying to get rid of them. Um, we'd love to. It may require some financial enumeration on my part maybe to, to motivate them, but I think it's a negative for our business. So I'm trying real hard. Additionally, we're looking at potentially getting the Margaritaville uh, sign taken down if we can get some of that space for office on the second floor. So we may be able to reduce some of the signage clutter uh, on that side of the building. I'm trying, but it's a, it's a gorgeous building. It's the, the rooftop though, it's like a whole nother level. I mean, it's a kitchen, bar, bathrooms. It's got, you know, you can see that the elevators go all the way up. It's a it's a tall building from the viewpoint on Broadway looking down towards Second. Uh, we hope to be open as soon as we get our permit. You know, construction's moving forward really fast. Uh, we want to be open this summer. And uh, we have the best sign company in uh, Tennessee. Uh, Jocelyn Sign is here uh, if you have any questions for them as well. But, um, you know, we're real... Uh, we're really excited to do something super special in this location because everything's up on the other side of Broadway. We want to bring the business down toward the river. The view is great from the rooftop. It's just gorgeous. Thanks. Any questions? Well, I'm just very happy to hear you, you, you talk about this building. It's been one of my favorites for, for forever. And, um, and so I appreciate you talking to them about that LED sign that's just so glaring, you know, from Glenn Campbell. And we're excited to have, have you here and hope you move here soon. Well, if you just talk to my daughter. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, I hate to put the rain on the parade. I, too, am excited, uh, you know, new business coming into this corner and revitalize a father. Uh, but my reservation is, should we allow extra size? Because this building is three-story. And yes, it is corner of the Broadway and Second Avenue. And it, but guideline clearly state the building, you know, uh, under four story is 16 feet. And if we allow extra 20 feet in that corner, and, uh, you know, do, are we allowing every other single building in the, you know, Broadway and third, Broadway and fourth, Broadway and fifth? 
So it will be every single corner will be enlarged sign. So I am uh, afraid of, you know, setting precedent in that sense. And as far as sign modification, I see as a, you know, uh, historical content. So this sign, yes, indeed, nice and simple and elegant. But uh, I think it can be done within the guideline. For, for that sense, I'm uh, inclined to support staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. I have to agree with Commissioner Johnson. Uh, also excited about the project. Um, I've been on the commission long enough to see that we get a lot of pressure from the downtown um, business owners for th these things. And I, I sometimes feel like we're the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike, you know? And as soon as we start making exceptions for one person, it's gonna happen all up and down Broadway. Uh, the guidelines to me on this are very clearly written. Um, and I think the staff recommendation is, is a solid one. And uh, I still think even with four feet shorter, people walking on Broadway, pedestrians are, are, will be able to, to see the business and what's there uh, clearly uh, and sufficiently uh, given what the rules are, so. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I, I also agree and, and I hear the, our, you know, the, the want for taking some off one facade, you know, some square footage off one to, to the other, but that just, again, with everything we deal with, I just can't even imagine the math problems that we'd be asked to do on all these other buildings um, if that were to, to go forward. Um, so if there are no other comments from anyone, and I also, uh, just real quick, I appreciated the real deep dive into those, the storefront versus you know, window mm -hmm. and why they're appropriate here mm -hmm. on this specific building, um, which I think is a great option, again, for, for this specific building in its uh, history and, and style. So with that, um, for 111 Broadway, I move for approval with all staff recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Second. Commissioner Johnson has seconded. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, none opposed. That motion passes. Are there any other comments? Okay. Thank you again, applicant. Thank you so much for your time and safe travels back. And come back soon. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Our next case today is at 1005 West Eastland Avenue in the Maxwell Heights Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. And this is a contributing house constructed circa 1922. Uh, a rear addition to the house was recently approved uh, with an administrative permit. Uh, and that permit was reviewed under the Consolidated Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Design Guidelines. Uh, and specified that the original wood siding uh, was to be retained. After starting the addition and getting into the rehabilitation, uh, the contractor has had an opportunity to assess the condition of the building, and today they are requesting to replace the siding. They are also requesting to enlarge three pairs of windows on the right side of the house. The windows, uh, this is the right elevation, the windows at the midpoint, <clears throat> excuse me, towards the rear of the existing, at the midpoint and towards the rear of the existing building uh, are in bedrooms. Uh, so the applicant would like to lower the sills approximately six inches uh, to uh, meet egress requirements. The widths and pattern of windows will otherwise not change. The pair of windows closer to the front of the house are on a box bay that has been altered. Uh, those windows there now are not original and will be replaced with windows that would match the, uh, the other two new pairs of windows uh, with a wider mullion, uh, more like it would have had historically. Uh, because the front pair is not original and because the others are at the midpoint or beyond, and the change in size is minimal, staff finds that aspect of the application to be appropriate. The existing siding on the house is in need of repair. Uh, it has had many coats of paint that are cracked and peeling. 
however, the wood siding itself has a very distinctive Dutch lap, uh, ship lap, with very narrow reveal and mitered corners. Uh, staff finds that this is a very distinctive feature of the house. Uh, the applicant proposes to replace the siding with new wood siding, uh, which would be custom milled to match. Uh, before the, the design guide consolidation, we would not have reviewed siding replacement in this overlay. So matching wood siding is much better than what would have been possible a year ago. However, uh, the design guidelines say that if siding is to be, uh, say that if siding can be rehabilitated, it must be re rehabilitated and can only be replaced or appropriate to replace in quote, in cases of extreme deterioration. And staff uh, did not find this uh, condition to be extreme deterioration. Um, the paint is lead-based paint, uh, which is usually present on any building older than 1978. Um, so uh, there are certainly considerations and special procedures required for removing lead-based paint, but preservation professionals everywhere deal with that every day. Uh, and that uh, knowledge and expertise is readily available. Uh, additionally, similar Precautions would be need to be taken whether the siding is stripped or replaced. Uh, so mitigating the lit, having to mitigate the lead is not uh, necessarily a hardship that uh, denying replacement would uh, impose. Staff recommends approval of the proposal to replace the three pairs of windows on the right side of the house with larger windows. Staff recommends disapproval of the application to replace the original wood siding um, according to the guidelines for the Maxwell Heights uh, Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Thank you, Sean. Any questions to him for the moment? Uh, Sean, I do have a question. If, uh, if we uh, agree that you reuse the existing siding uh, to re restore that and bring it back, does the staff work with the applicant to identify the areas to be replaced with new material or is that left up to the to the purview of the contractor um, say that again one more time if the so, so you know typically in a house of this age there will be areas that have rotted and deteriorated and have to be replaced mm -hmm. uh, is that something the staff works with the applicant to identify those areas or does that is that just up to the contractor I'd certainly be willing to but I it's not something that has come up um, I can't think of it. Well, very few times that it, that siding replacement has come up in with the 30 some overlays or 28 or so overlays. Um, until last year, we did not review siding replacement sure. and conservation zoning overlays. So really only Germantown and Edgefield were the only two where it, where it ever came up. And it was so rare um, in, in those overlays. Okay. Um, Certainly, we'd be willing to, to help, but it's not something that we've had experience doing with applicants in the past. I'll add Woodland and Waverly to that list. Yes, yes. absolutely. Woodland um, and Waverly, Tanglewood, but we haven't yeah. had any permits in Tanglewood. And so what we've done, or at least I've done, is usually the applicant comes to us and says, we need to replace it here, here, and here, and we check it and, and bless it or, or not. Um, the applicant is here, and they are very skilled and experienced contractors, and they can probably tell you more about that than I can, if you'd like to, to hear from them. Sean, it was, oops, sorry, one additional point. You did mention that the um, enlargement of the windows was to meet um, the code, which is a very yes specific thing in terms of height for egress in the event of a fire or to escape smoke. So I, I think is that condition to be, to, to note that amongst commissioners and for anybody else who might want to apply. Um, I, th I think the staff's analysis was spot on, but that certainly is something we would um, take into account in, in uh, bedrooms. Just to piggyback on Vice Chair, I think it is, um, since we ha haven't reviewed siding so often, that because that's been added to consolidated as well, that it's really important for us to sort of find out what what our follow-up is on that. Not that we want to give you more work, <laughs> but it seems to be, especially this particular construction, seems to be very well noted to 
have another eye on it. And it's great if the con the contractor would say, "Hey, we're, you know, we we don't want to run. Ha you know what? We're just doing. We're being proactive. I believe." And with I, I, I concur with the vice chair that when we can have that con conversation and have a public awareness of that, that you know, if you're we've we've said, please keep your this particular historic detail that um, that is a sensitive item to watch. Yeah. So thank you for watching, staff. <laughs> the applicant has, has done everything right. I mean, they they called us before to, and we went out and took a look at it. Um, and it is just something that's that's new for us mm -hmm. with the new guidelines. We've right. only had one siding replacement application in the past year since those guidelines went in effect. And that one was in more advanced decay than this one. Right. I think we had one Dutch lap that we reviewed, if I recall, one time. But it's a very unique structure and just good to keep watching. I, I would have said it's unique, but when I met the contractor, the adjacent oh. house has the same side. Okay. Me, so there are two. <laughs> All right, applicant, are you? I've got oh, you, one more just oh, quick question. Sorry, Lee. I'm sorry, just going back through this to make sure I'm clear. In one place in the report, it says that they're requesting to replace it with fiber cement, and one place it says they're requesting to replace it with wood. So which one is it? Uh, yes, I'm sorry about that. I, no, 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 that's okay. I'd I just written wanted that to... and then met with them and, advi and revised, but I guess I didn't catch both. Uh, they, they did say that it would be with wood. Okay, thanks. Good catch there, Commissioner. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Costello. Uh, with Costello Construction, uh, and I'll have to say, um, I worked with Sean many years on several different projects, probably 20 or 30 projects over the years in uh, different historical sections, and have enjoyed the relationship, Rob and the rest, uh, but I've never been to one of these meetings, and it's fascinating. <laughs> Just <laughs> FYI, uh, I, I feel like a, a little ant uh, with my little my little questions compared to some of the big questions that y'all have dealt with. But it's been uh, very informative and entertaining. I've had a good time. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't promise I can't promise to return just for the entertainment value, but uh, so far it has been very enjoyable. So uh, I do have good news. Our, our windows won't actually have to change much. Uh, we, we were concerned about ingress and egress. We've worked with uh, Dale Incorporated, uh, Christy over there to, uh, with the Marvin Elite uh, windows that because these old windows have the window weights in them and the extremely wide mullen, by taking advantage of that space, we'll be able to still keep about the same profile on the outside, but we'll be able to make the windows slightly wider so we won't have to make them much taller. So I doubt, seriously, there'll be any noticeable difference other than they won't be broken, <laughs> hopefully, which about every other window in this house. Uh, and many of the projects that I've worked with over the years you know, people walk through them, and they we have engineers look at them, and they refer to houses that, uh, you know, are have good bones. Um, this is not one of those uh, houses. It's good location, and it is uh, an attractive house, and it, and I think it does deserve to be preserved. Uh, I enjoy that part of what we do. However, there are several aspects of this where there have been foundation failures. We've had structural engineers brought in where they told us that we have to replace rotting uh, cedar post with, uh, with concrete uh, support. It won't affect the outside look. It'll just support it better. But there is a box, uh, a box uh, window addition, part of what Sean's already referred to, where the non-matching windows are currently uh, there, that has sagged on the opposite side. There's sort of a bay window that is supported by some rickety concrete blocks. We're going to have to do quite a bit of, of readjusting. What I was hoping, part of what I was hoping to accomplish by replacing this siding, in addition to just getting rid of, you know, the obviously bad parts and, and the lead-based paint, I was hoping to be able to add sheathing Currently, the siding is uh, fastened directly to the studs, to the frame. Um, there's no sheathing uh, on that side. Um, 
we could improve the rigidity of the building and help support it if we were able to remove that siding, add the um, <coughs> sheathing on the outside, and then put on new siding. I have uh, researched, uh, found, we, we quite often deal with uh, Cox Interiors, uh, a material supplier uh, for interior trim, crown moldings, bases, and such. Uh, they have a mill in Campbellsville, Kentucky that will custom make this exact same Dutch lap profile. So once it has a coat of paint on it, you'll never know that it wasn't original. It's poplar. The, what's currently on the house is poplar, and what would be replaced would be poplar as well. So that was what I was hoping to accomplish, is, is structurally I think it would be better to have this house sheathed before it had the siding on it. Uh, obviously that helped in uh, meeting energy codes and things like that as well. Uh, I think that's all the... Okay, thank you. And yes. anyone have any questions for the applicant? I, I do have a question for the applicant related to you know, the trims. Um, uh, I, I don't want to tell you your business because I'm, I'm, it sounds like you know it, but um, when you come and add, say you add half-inch sheathing, um, if you can get away with that, you may have to go plywood instead of OSB to get something that thin, but you sort of take the outside envelope and your trim reveal around the windows becomes lessened if you don't remove that trim. Would, would If you were to, if, if it were necessary to remove all of the siding and that were approved, would the window trim come off and that that would also move out that additional half inch yes. to maintain the, the reveals and have all that look correct? Yes. Yes. In fact, there would be no visual change at all to the building. You would, you would not know. Uh, it's just that structurally, it would be more sound. Energy-wise, you know, we would have that extra layer that would help. And I think 19, what is it? we said, almost 100 years old, right? Yeah, right at 100 years old, mm -hmm. which is amazing to me. And I'm, I'm glad that y'all are doing what you're doing because I think these houses deserve to be saved. This house with paint stripped and put on it is, is not gonna be here 100 years from now. Um, it, needs some, it needs some real structural help and some, some strengthening. I think what I'm proposing to do would ensure that it would last another 100 years. Uh, I think it would have helped the integrity of the house and visually, historically, no one's gonna know the difference. It's just we're gonna have, we're gonna have new poplar Dutch lap siding with good coat of primer and paint on it, as opposed to not so good popular siding with not as good an opportunity to prime. Quick paint. question for you too: Do you also plan to miter the corners like this with no? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, that's sir. I think that's a that is a design element that I think is important. We've done many times, particularly on a siding that has that kind of profile. You can do it on a bevel siding, you can do it on a lap siding, and it, it looks okay, but when you do it on a siding like this that has that additional uh, contour, I think it's attractive. Uh, one other thing I didn't mention, uh, the by, about a thousand square foot addition has already been approved. Right now we can put any kind of siding we want to on that, uh, which would probably be I don't know. Well, I'll talk to Sean about it to make sure. I don't don't want to. So this is just on one side. No, ma'am. Uh, the this what we would be doing. The uh, the addition is on the rear. Okay. The addition okay. is on the rear. All right. Yes. Just want so, to clarify so what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The front and the two sides are what's visible from the road. Uh, the rear siding is going to have to be removed anyway to make uh, connection with the addition. But what I was proposing uh, is carrying that same, if we were able to replace this siding, is just carrying that through the addition too, which for all practical purposes would make it look like it's been there forever. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but for, for homeowners, <laughs> for homeowners it's, a, it's usually considered to be a good thing so that everything matches and we'll use the same windows throughout, same roofing throughout, same paints. Uh, I think it can be a beautiful home. I think it can have good bones, but though we, we need to do a little bit of orthopedic surgery on it. In, in terms of energy efficiency, you could do it on the interior. Yes, ma'am. Well, what we would do um, probably is foam the walls, sometimes mm -hmm. on a siding that's applied directly to the frame. When you do that, 
the, that foam tends to want to leak out uh, because the, the, the seal is not 100% in some places. Uh, but that's a minor thing. Uh, mainly what we accomplished by sheathing it is we're able to tie it to the framing members and it adds some rigidity sure. to the, to the mm -hmm. walls. Structural. Got yes, it. Anyone else? Okay. For the moment, thank you very much. Right. I think you. I learned a lot from you today. Appreciate y'all's time. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, open, open public hearing. Close public hearing. Commissioners? Oh, open discussion. Yeah, um, exactly. I was prepared to come here and, and uh, move to approve with the staff recommendations when I thought that it was going to be replaced with fiber cement siding. I'm a fan of old siding. I'm a fan of old Dutch lap and this unique uh, type of siding. We're, this is kind of new frontier for us with um, with siding. So, I mean, my inclination as a preservationist is to keep the original materials um, and work around them. That's what this is not unusual for, for siding like this to be attached directly to the structural members. My own house has it. Um, so I know all of it can be addressed, so, but I would like to hear what other people think uh, about the new information that we have today about the plant um, contractors' plans. I think it is quite interesting, but it does say in the guidelines, historic cladding shall be retained. Yeah. So it's a good, good discussion. I think we're um, getting into a bit of building science, this comment, Will, and just by my saying it, uh, please don't think I'm an expert. <laughs> but um, in making a building more, in it, so if you leave the siding on, this is not an, an argument necessarily for pulling it off, but it is. it does have to deal, I think, a little bit with building science and how these historic homes breathed before and then now we're placing upon them mechanical HVAC, you know, performance and, and uh, new performance guidelines that they, they just was not, that was not the intent when they were first built. The building can breathe and if moisture gets in the wood, it can, you know, it can come out the back and through the cavity. And, and if you foam that to meet a homeowner's desire to not have a, you know, $600 electric bill, even a closed cell foam is going to change the performance of that system. Um, again, this is building science, not historic preservation. So I think uh, I am, I want to say I'm compelled, but certainly my, my ears are raised a little bit in, in just in terms of the constructability of some of these details and what the performance might be to leave the siding on and then spray foam the back of it and how that will perform over 100 years. Um, Perhaps um, somebody with more knowledge about that, or maybe even some experience, if there exists, um, with some of the resources that the staff of the historic commission has, that we at least ask that question and work with the applicant to provide the. You, you have, it seems you have a homeowner and a contractor with the willingness to um, do this correctly. One way or the other is is what is the um, the the right way to go about it. I, I don't. I don't have anything definitive to say other, other than I think I, I, like Commissioner Price, think you know, keeping the siding that isn't deteriorated as is, is from a historic perspective, is, is the right thing to do. I just don't know what um, some of the things we might do to the back of that might not yield the best outcome for, uh, or the long longevity, the longest outcome, the most um, energy efficient and longest performing outcome of a wood siding. So, so having owned a couple of homes with uh, with some wood siding and dealing with this, and you know, one of the things I found that was really helpful and really inspired is one of the reasons these homes have lasted for 100 years was they did not have insulation. And siding, especially narrow siding like this, as it approaches a century old, it does wind up, and, and the mitered corners, you do wind up with water infiltration. And with, without insulation, that means that when the sun comes out the, and the air moves up through that wall, that it dries out and doesn't permanently damage the wood. The, uh, the, the, and I've kept my uh, walls that do not have sheathing 
uninsulated because most of the heat goes out the roof anyway. But, uh, but I think 12% or so goes out the wall. And, uh, and I think that, uh, by the way, the national, uh, the historic sources uh, don't recommend foam for these historic walls because it can't be removed in the future. And so if you did use a fiberglass and you did leave it with an exposed condition where water does get in through the siding, uh, which it's bound to do over time, then, uh, then you do wind up with an even worse problem with wet fiberglass insulation inside. Mm -hmm. So um, for those reasons, and, and, and looking at the photographs, I haven't been to the site, haven't seen it, but it structurally doesn't look like it's as robust as you might want it to be. And, uh, and I'm pretty compelled by the, by the ideas uh, for you know, strengthening the structure, you know, especially with the number of, uh, of projects that we've seen come before us that have had tornado damage. And this would be especially susceptible to that. So, so for those reasons, and because uh, I have been impressed with the contractor's approach to having the wood milled, uh, and I'm, I'm leaning toward the sheathing so that you can have that waterproof layer do whichever kind of insulation you want to on the inside and and still maintain the same look, if not better. Uh, it'll look like it was when it was newly built uh, with new wood. I think the other factor to me, though, is the we do talk about old growth wood versus new growth wood. I think with, with pine, that's especially important because the old growth pine was so much different than the farmed pine. But with poplar, I don't think that's as big an issue because most poplar comes from the woods where it grows in virtually the same kind of condition that it did before. So, so for, from those reasons, I'm more compelled to, to grant the exception for the siding. Mm -hmm. I think what's compelling as well is that when we say there's some a professional who gives good presentation about how they would process that, and I think this is one of the first contractors that I've heard has really gone into the detail of what he would do. Um, and I think because what, this is a new territory for us a bit, is that, you know, we staff are hearing this, is that we make sure if we do do this, and if for future, if when we do analyze this kind of project, is that we be sure who's doing the work um, is reputable and credible as well. Which again was compelling because this contractor gave us a lot of information. Again, not an endorsement, but if we um, allow the removal and reinstallation, I think the particular attention being paid to the trims and that those be removed and have the same reveal. You know, there's detail up at the soffit and where the roof meets the wall that we not, you know, going from eight inches to six inches can have some unintended consequences that uh, there's, there's more attention paid to um, how those details work out and, and that things that align now should align or at least come really close to aligning um, and not have funky trim pieces that cover up poor construction technique mm -hmm. <laughs> that we see from time to time. Not, yeah. I'm not insinuating this contractor would do that, but we see it from time to time just because some of those details are, are, are not realized until after the fact and there's only so many options to be able to rectify them. Yeah, I have to say, you know, I came here thinking, you know, a lot like um, Commissioner Price of, you know, keep, obviously, you know, our number one task is to keep these historic buildings, including their, you know, historic materials, you know, of which this is um, a very important, you know, defining feature of this home. Um, but then, you know, I, um, we see a, a, a lot of, you know, things come through here and it's, oh, well, you know, well, this turned out to, you know, reading between the lines, something turned out to be, you know, more expensive and then they, you know, want a cheaper option, which a lot of times is not the historic option. But, you know, with, again, I was persuaded by the presentation uh, on the specific house and, you know, m do it, whilst, while I'm sure it would be painstaking and expensive, you know, and to, to go through the restoration process of this, you know, I honestly don't know if it would be any less of a 
painstaking or cost, you know, benefit to reinstall wood, you know, that specific for, you know, specifically milled wood for this home. Again, it's not just the hardy siding, you know, the, the easy choice, the cheap choice, you know, these are expensive elements um, that they're bringing in. Um, you know, wood is an expensive element right now, especially. And so I just think with that, and the, again, the details called out by Commissioner Mosley of the, the trim pieces and the window and making sure those, you know, facades and, and the connections just continue to look the same, um, you know, just for the the energy benefits, you know, as a homeowner, you know, wanting just, you know, well, water tight and, you know, energy efficient, more energy efficient home um, that will, in, in my eyes, hopefully for the neighborhood, retain the same look um, as the contractor, um, you know, assured, then, you know, again, I, I think I've been um, persuaded uh, on this one to kind of, with those details, again, be on kind of Commissioner Stewart's train. Uh, with uh, with that being said, and, and uh, sensing a, an agreement here, I'll go ahead and take a motion. I do have one uh, thing that I do challenge with the contractor that he said, and that is I think if he does the project in the way that he's looking at doing it, it may well be here in 100 years from now as well. And so, uh, yeah. um, so uh, with respect to uh, uh, 1005 uh, West Eastland Avenue, I move for approval. Uh, of the proposal to replace the three pairs of windows um, uh, with, uh, with windows that are as close to the existing dimensions as possible. And I move for uh, approval of the application to replace the original wood siding with the conditions that the siding be the same specie, dimension, uh, and detailing as what's on the original house, and that the windows be trimmed out as well as the uh, soffit and other elements of the house in a manner identical to what was on the original house. There's a great motion on the floor. Who is second it? Second. Okay, Commissioner Jones, second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? One opposed, and that would be Commissioner jo uh, Commissioner Price. I'm sorry. Um, so I'll make one comment too, because again, this is we don't want to set precedents because we just created these updated and revised um, historical guidelines. However, on the guideline, if we will read it, and it says when it is appropriate to replace siding, and Vice Chair had said this, but let's just be really clear, the casings and openings should be retained, and the new siding shall re replicate the reveal and dimensions of the historic siding. I think that's what's really important, is that when we're following our guidelines, we're not really truly making exceptions, but because it gives us the leverage to do that. So um, I think our commission really thinks through this stuff. So contractors, just be wary because we will drill you. <laughs> and if you don't do it that way, then we will come back. <laughs> and then it also makes precedence for the next contractor that comes. And, and, and our commission um, looks at these projects on site just singly. So it's not a blanket. So beware. All right. Anyone else? Okay, thank you again, and um, thank you so much for your details on that. Okay, next is 1807 Lakehurst Avenue. This is an application for a two-story addition to a one-story contributing house located at 1807 Lakehurst in the Little Hollywood section of Lachlan Springs. Staff issued an administrative permit for a one-story outbuilding on this lot in 2021. Due to the grade of the lot, that structure will sit uphill behind the house and will be visible from the street in elevation as seen here. The applicant has not yet constructed this outbuilding and would like to request an addition instead that rises as tall in elevation. Staff finds that while the height of the detached outbuilding in the rear yard is appropriate, the same elevation height in a fully attached addition is not. The guidelines state that an addition should not exceed the number of stories of the historic house, and that in cases where a taller addition is appropriate, it should be no more than two feet taller. The proposed addition is two stories behind a one-story house 
and rises about six feet, eight inches taller. Staff finds the proposal does not meet the design guidelines for height and for massing. Here are a few renderings of the proposed project. The addition includes an attached garage at the main level, which is typically not allowed by the design guidelines. However, Little Hollywood has a unique context and attached garages are common here. Given this, staff finds that the proposed side-facing garage could be appropriate to the specific context and that the provided two-foot inset is sufficient. The setback, insets, and square footage all meet the design guidelines. Final materials have not been chosen, but can be worked out at the staff level. If this were a one-story addition that rose no taller than the historic house, it would meet the guidelines. The primary issue here is the height. In conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the proposed addition, finding that the project does not meet sections 7A1 and 7B2, 3, 5, and 8 for massing and scale. The applicant is here and I think would like to speak. Also, you have received public comment. I think you should have a letter from the architect and I think six letters from neighbors. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, thank you all so much. I don't know why I'm so nervous. You've been so nice. So if I speak <laughs> oh, don't be. quickly, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but thank you all so much for the time and consideration uh, to this project. Um, my name is Meredith. I live at Lakehurst with my partner, Nicole. Um, we're hoping to both live and work from the property since we're working from home. Um, and we've owned it and lived it since 2016. Um, so yeah, first want to thank our neighbors for their support. It's been overwhelming. And um, they've been just as invested in this whole project as we have been, which has been really great. We found a, a really good community there and um, just are, are overwhelmed with, with all of the support. Um, also want to thank our architect, Jason, who has submitted um, the application. Uh, we picked him specifically because we know, we've been friends with him in the past and know that he has worked with this commission for both residential and commercial projects. And so we know that he values the architecture and the um, the history of Nashville in a way that you know we, we wouldn't necessarily find with somebody that maybe wasn't from here. Um, when we first began this process, uh, we were working with the historic staff and had asked specifically about guidelines to flat roof houses because we couldn't find any and they couldn't either. So um, what we're thinking in terms of precedent is it's not, it shouldn't set a precedent and we should be open to leniency in these guidelines because there isn't any for a flat roof house. It's all sloped. Uh, houses or sloped roof houses, um, which kind of puts us in, in a little bit of a pickle, um, to say the least. That along with the grade is is kind of you know working against us. Um, so we do think that there is the lack of call out and flat roof structures warrants a variance there and should allow some leniency in that guideline. Um, in terms of the height, we since it's already been the disapproval of the height shouldn't be considered since there since there was already approval to that structure and the back house at the same height. So. Sorry, I know that I just stopped really fast, but appreciate your time and, and I'm here to um, help answer any questions if you have any, but thank you again all so much. Thank you. Any questions to the applicant at the moment? Okay, we might. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. All right, um, open public hearing. Close public hearing. Just maybe to Jenny, just as a quick clarification. So the, there was a previously administratively approved outbuilding. I'm guessing that, so if the, you know, the slope is like this, if you know, the house is here, the outbuilding was further off, therefore it was high, started at a higher point, and that's why it's the same height, because I said it was a one-story outbuilding. It's a one-story outbuilding that they were pro proposing to um, site on the hill that slopes up mm -hmm. behind the house. You can see um, for the addition, you can see that retaining wall, it's a little tricky to see in the far right there. Mm -hmm. They're proposing to dig out behind and still rise another story above. Does that make sense? Okay. So in, in elevation, it will be the same height as that outbuilding would visually be if you could even view it in true elevation. Does yeah. that make sense? Um, but actually, it will be further back, and it would be up on the hill. So mm -hmm. that, that's their argument is that it's the same Height. Visual from the street. <laughs> but that would okay. be kind of a sea level height you wouldn't actually ever see except in true elevation. Um, and it would be seated, yes, further back. But it was just hill. further back on the lot, back obviously, because it was up. an outbuilding. And, and not, this one is not connected digging out in that closer. Case. And okay. Correct. Does that make sense? Thank you. 
Yep. Madam Chair, uh, yes, ma'am. I just thought uh, the comment. Uh, I do understand uh, the support with, of the neighbors, and I really appreciate it because you know when you have like a tight knit, uh, connected, unique neighborhood, they would like to support each other. But at the same token, you know those neighbor and larger area in the historic district, they are the one uh, produced a design guideline. So I am a little bit really about uh, straying from those design guidelines just because surrounding neighbors like it. So understand, I think uh, addition and outbuilding is different, although kind of visually may look same height, but outbuilding is not literally connected and therefore it's meet design guideline with you know, uh, one story. But in this case, it's a, uh, you know, two story design guideline. And if it can be lower, uh, you know, regular meet the guideline, uh, but two feet above the existing house, uh, that would be okay. But I think six foot, eight inches taller than existing height seems like a bit, uh, you know, uh, too uh, massive to me. So in that sense, I'm, as of right now, I'm inclining uh, to staff recommendation, and I think there's more room to walk to reduce the height. And so that's why I am. And I'm interested here, you know, other commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner. Did you close the public hearing? I did. You did? Okay, sorry. I'm I must not say that loud enough. I am <laughs> I so sorry. Staff, if I don't, please, you just say, Manet, close the public hearing. Thank you. No, I, was just I am sure. speaking way too low. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with Commissioner Johnson. I've, um, while it may seem like it's two, you know, the same thing packaged two different ways, it is a what's what's proposed now is a two-story addition to a one-story house, and I just I feel like that is does not comply with the guidelines. So um, I'm in agreement with the staff recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I too am in agreement with the staff's recommendation. I, I think for the applicant, um, again, we're, we're not here to design things for them, but I, I would be, given the constraints of the lot, I, I would be more compelled by a design that might violate a setback in the rear or, or something along those lines to give a little more flexibility to park cars. Uh, you know, I, I know there's going to be some more expense um, foundation wise and number of windows and, you know, exterior uh, surface area of the house to do. A more sprawling one-story addition and one that might have multi, you know a different level at the back as the as the outbuilding does. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a, a one-story is a one-story is a one-story would be my um, analysis on this one as well, and in agreement with the staff's recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I applaud the applicant for being such a good neighbor. It's uh, it's obvious that there's a lot of strong sentiment and uh, and good relations in the neighborhood. However, we see a lot of requests uh, almost every month for building a two-story addition behind a one-story house. And, uh, and, and this one, although it has some uniqueness, I don't think enough to warrant uh, violating that, that standard. And as I read through the guidelines again, uh, I think it's, it's supported. I don't think having sloped roofs and flat roofs uh, makes a significant enough difference between what's written in the guidelines about not putting a two-story addition onto a one-story house. So I'm in agreement with staff recommendations as well. Thank you, Vice Chair. Go ahead. Good. Anybody? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so with respect to 1807 Lakehurst Avenue, uh, I move uh, for agreement with the staff recommendation. There's a motion, Vice Chair. Second. Commissioner is also made a second. May Hall. I have to say that right away. <laughs> okay. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? All right. None opposed. So this motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, applicant. <clears throat> Next item is 918 Bradford. 
which is a house that was constructed about 1926. Um, although it was constructed in the 1920s, staff determined that its materials, form, and location all the way at the back of the lot uh, where an outbuilding typically would be located did not contribute to the historic character of the Waverly Belmont conservation overlay. So you can't really tell in this photo, but that this house basically sits on the alley and um, the photos don't really show, but it has a lot of like concrete block, vinyl siding. There's not really any materials um, that are historic remaining. It's been changed over the years and staff found with all those conditions combined that it was um, not a historic structure um, and that it could be demolished. So we did issue a permit for its demolition in January 2022. The applicant is proposing an infill and a detached accessory dwelling unit. Here are the site plans. Um, it is meeting all the base zoning setbacks. Here is a proposed front facade. Um, in context, uh, can you see? Yeah. Okay. You can't see it on the screen, but <laughs> uh, not at least on the screen. But yes, uh, it's the photo. Of, uh, it's an image of the um, of the proposed infill with on either side the um, um, existing structures. The house to the left is historic. The house to the right. Uh, was new construction, new construction that was constructed prior to the implementation of this overlay. Um, the infill is one and a half stories, which meets the historic context. The height is a maximum height of 25 feet from the top of the foundation, and staff finds this to be similar to other historic houses in the immediate vicinity. Um, likewise, its width of 34 feet meets the historic context. And overall, staff finds that the infill's height, scale, and design meet the historic context. Uh, staff does recommend that the front porch columns have caps and bases just to kind of finish um, off the look of it. Uh, here are the two side elevations. Here are the um, drawings of the dadu, which again meets all the design guidelines. Here are some renderings, perspective drawings, and more renderings. And here are some context photos. So you can see kind of the, the top image there shows that the house is way at the back of the lot um, and um, that there are several non-contributing, relatively recent uh, infill houses that were constructed prior to the overlay. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval. Um, pretty much, I won't read through all of them, but pretty much with all of our standard approvals or standard recommendations, except that we are requiring the front porch columns to have caps and bases. The applicant is watching um, at their office, but is not here in person. And they are in agreement with our staff recommendation. Thank you, Melissa. Any questions? OK. All right. I, I, I guess I do have one question. In looking at the rendering, um, it's a, sort of a heavy timbered treatment of the front porch. And I think having bases on top of the masonry makes a lot of sense, but I'm not sure how the detailing for the caps would be yeah. on that heavy timber yeah. type construction. I think that's a fair point, yeah. Are you suggesting anything, Vice Chair? Yeah. Any, any thoughts, Ben? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, depending on how decorative that ends up being, uh, you know, if it's something that's like framing lumber that's wrapped in hardy siding, it doesn't appear that that's what the effect that you're looking for, but appearance and or design and, and appearance or construction is sometimes different. Um, you know, if, if there's some sort of bracket or, or some joinery that, that happens, I, I would agree that, you know, you, you don't see, uh, you don't trim that out uh, in, in a heavy timber situation. I'm, I'm, I agree with your comment that, that the base would be um, would be appropriate, but certainly at, at, the, at the joinery not necessary, and that maybe the... Uh, some additional conversation with staff between the applicant and, and, the, and the staff just to, to verify what that's going to look like and that there be a final approval at the staff level that um, would, would certainly be permitted without some tr without trim at the joinery at the uh, upper part of the connection. Okay, does that sound reasonable? Okay. Any other comments? Okay. So, so based on that with respect Please. to... Vice Chair, we haven't opened public hearing yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, am, I have been duly noted on my job. <laughs> but thank you, sir. All right. So since the applicant is not here and we're going to now open public hearing, I'm going to now close public hearing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Vice Chair, you're on. <laughs>
So, um, so with respect to 918 Bradford Avenue, I move for approval with staff conditions uh, with the clarification that uh, applicant work with staff on the uh, tops of the columns on the front porch and that if staff finds it appropriate, it would not be required to have a traditional column capital. Very good. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Johnson. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? None seeing. That motion passes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1607 Russell is uh, an infill that was approved by the Metro Historic Zoning Commission in 1994 uh, and was constructed shortly thereafter. Because of its state of construction, it does not contribute to the historic character of the neighborhood, and MHCC staff has issued a preservation permit for its demolition. Um, so this is an application for infill. Uh, so here's a site plan. Um, the outbuilding shown on the site plan is not part of the current proposal and will likely come back um, for approval later. Um, maybe at staff level. Um, and the infill does meet all base zoning setbacks. The infill is one and a half stories with a hipped roof form and a gabled front. The scale and form are predominant in the immediate historic context and um, its height of 24 feet above the foundation and width of 32 feet 8 inches also meets the historic context and the design guidelines. So here are the side elevations. You can see it kind of has a hip roof front in the back, in the front, but in the back it's more of a gable form. Um, and since it's infill and that won't be largely visible, staff found that to be appropriate. So here are some context photos. This is a pretty small context here in this, in this area. It's pretty much one, some one and a half story houses uh, with a lot of hipped roofs and um, kind of that folk Victorian type of house. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval of the project. I won't read through these again. It's just all of our standard conditions um, that we are recommending approval with our standard conditions. Uh, the applicant is here. Is it, he is in agreement with the staff recommendations and has said that he will not speak unless you okay. have a question or would like him to speak. So Very good. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, applicant. I have a question for Melissa. Oh, sure. Um, this type and era of infill, there's a lot of them around East Nashville. Right. And I've noticed over the years that they... Like there's a lot of rotten siding in windows. Does this house have that? You know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I think that there are issues with it. I don't know the specifics about the issues yeah. of why the house, you know, it was better to take it down and, and rebuild a house. Yeah. Um, so I don't know the specifics. Just because it wasn't a historic house, I didn't really question. I, I guess it it's just a quick point. that well, We talk a lot about quality of materials and why we mandate. And yeah. this era of infill, I've just noticed there's a lot of rotten stuff on it. It's so interesting. Why we... I don't know. I just want to say that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good point. Thank I'm, you. I have a question about, and I forgive me. I, I can't really. Again, my screen is unreadable. The uh, in the in the front elevation, there's some. I'm confused by the, and maybe it's just a, the effect of rendering. Is there like a double double beam there above the porch? I think that's... With the lines are really close. Uh, I'm, yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not peculiar. sure, but I think that, and I can ask the um, designer to clarify, um, but I think that it is maybe a misrendering of it. Yeah. But we can work that out with, with the uh, applicant and the to kind of clarify what that is and make sure that it's typical of what we typically approve. The, the columns, yeah, again, this could be a function of the rendering. The columns just seem a little thin proportionally. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you mm -hmm. know, just I don't know if that's a guideline issue or just a me, yeah. <laughs> a me issue, but that, that uh, uh, some further detail of what, what really is this? It's, it's hard to tell in the okay. rendering. Sure. Yeah, I can look at the sides. I mean, I think it's like the sides aren't really, yeah, you can see the porch beam there, but it's not really clarifying what's happened. But I can work that out with the uh, designer. Yeah, as I zoom in on my, on the plans on my iPad here, it, it's just they've put in so many lines. But, yeah, we, I don't know what the material is. I haven't looked. But when you zoom in, it's not as dark of a feature. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot of those lines um, in the document itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Open public hearing. And close public hearing.
Motion or discussion? Mr. Bell, with respect to 1607 Russell Street, I recommend approval uh, with the staff's condition and an additional clarification from the designer with staff about details um, associated with the columns and beams at the front and rear porches. And that those you know beams typically are are beams. They're not clad in siding and have lots of lines and uh, just just some clarity brought to what those details look like and the size of the columns that they're proportional to, uh, and in keeping with the design guidelines and and not contrasting greatly with other um, historic houses in the district. Okay. There is a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I, I, I do have one, sure. one other uh, thing, too. The drawing shows uh, that the grade from the, the distance from the porch to the grade varies, but graphically it's shown at about four feet, which would require a handrail. And so I would, I would request that you include in your motion that if a handrail is required, that it be reviewed by the staff. So moved. Okay. We don't need to. Re we're good with that motion. Legal. Okay, all right. Okay, Commissioner Williams has seconded. All in favor of the motion? Okay. Any opposed? None seen. The motion passes. Any other comments? Nope. Okay. Thank you. We move on to our final. Thank you for waiting. All right, the last case we have is for 2000 Natchez Trace. The house located at 2000 Natchez Trace is a circa 1935 brick Tudor revival that contributes to the historic character of the Hillsborough Weston uh, neighborhood conservation zoning overlay. The applicant proposes to construct a rear addition and a detached outbuilding, and the application includes setback determinations to reduce the 20 foot street setback from Fairfax Avenue for both the addition and the outbuilding. Um, I'll present the addition first and, and then um, details of the outbuilding. So the proposed addition is located at the rear, to the rear of the historic house, does not more than double the footprint or extend wider. As proposed, it meets all setbacks except for the 20 foot street setback from Fairfax Avenue. The applicant has requested um, a setback determination to reduce that setback to approximately 13 feet, three inches. Uh, which would line up with the sidewall of the historic house. Staff finds that the proposed setback determination for the addition uh, to be appropriate uh, since it won't be any closer to that side property line than the existing house. So no changes to the historic house are proposed with the project. The addition meets the guidelines for height and scale, design materials, roof shape, and rhythm and proportion of openings. So here we have the front elevation and the side elevation that faces Fairfax Avenue. And here we have the interior side elevation as well as the, the rear. So moving on to the outbuilding, the proposed outbuilding is located in the rear yard and it meets all setbacks except for the 20 foot street setback from Fairfax Avenue, um, which the setback determination requested is to reduce that to approximately 10 feet one inch. So the commission usually sees a street side bulk zoning standard of 10 feet um, for outbuildings on corner lots. However, this case is different in that the lot, the, the rear of this lot does not back up to the rear of another lot. Rather, in this case, the, the rear yard backs up to the side yard of uh, the house at 2529 Fairfax Avenue. Um, so in that case, the, the setback, the street setback isn't allowed to be reduced um, per the zoning code. So that's why it's 20 feet instead of 10. Um, with that said, staff finds that the proposed setback determination could be appropriate in this case since the outbuilding is no closer to the street than the covered side porch of the historic house. And the, the commission has seen similar requests, um, um, maybe not in the nearby area, but in, in similar situations and found uh, similar reductions to be appropriate. So staff took that into consideration as well with this recommendation. The proposed outbuilding is one and a half stories with a footprint of approximately 700 square feet. The overall height is approximately 24 feet, which does not exceed the maximum height allowed by the guidelines 
or the height of the historic house. Staff finds that the outbuilding meets the design guidelines for height and scale, character and form, materials, roof form, and windows and doors. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the project with the following conditions. Uh, condition one is with, um, with staff approval of the final selections of the materials prior to purchase and installation. And condition two, um, that the, um, the standard condition about the HVAC and utility locations for the addition. Um, and with these conditions, staff finds that the project can meet section two of the design guidelines for the Hillsborough West End neighborhood conservation zoning overlay. Thank you, Melissa. So, I'm here if you have questions, the applicant is here as well. Yes, um, um, and also you did receive um, written comments from both the, the council member as well as the neighborhood association um, that were available before this meeting. Thank you. Madam Chair, I do yes. have a one clarifying question. So mm -hmm. setback determination is only applied to Fairfax Street side. Uh, does a building uh, 10 foot from the alley, does it apply any setback uh, modification or? No, the only setback determinations uh, are for the, the side. Uh, side property line along Fairfax Avenue. Um, the outbuilding meets all other base zoning setbacks, as does the addition. Thank you. That's what I thought. Appreciate it. Uh, I got one additional clarifying sure. um, question. Uh, the uh, HW Ian's letter mm -hmm. is well, sort of well written and, and puts together some good points, but uh, I, I wanted to, I guess, ask a, a further point if we don't allow it, or if, if we see fit that 10 feet is not sufficient. As designed, the building meets all of the base, accepting any setbacks. The, right. the building is not overly scaled. It's 700 square feet. It's not overly tall. And if it's restricted in, in its footprint, then it would be, it would be a taking from, uh, from, it could be viewed as a taking in that mm. if there were a 20 foot setback, it, can't, it would be out of the guidelines if it were taller. It can't, we don't want it to get closer to the neighbors and we want it to have the, set, the you know, the distance between the existing house. So um, we're, by restricting it further, it couldn't be 700 square feet, I guess is, is well, I, I want to make that clarifying point. I mean, it would be difficult. The, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Actually, the applicant has been working with the neighborhood association in the last few minutes even. Okay. So maybe okay. It, it would be easiest to go ahead and hear from yep. him. Perfect. Because there I, may already be some changes perfect. that satisfy everything. Wonderful. So, and I didn't note that there is an existing outbuilding here. Um, staff administratively issued a permit to demolish it. So, I mean, it's clear some sort of outbuilding would work. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Is it my turn now? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm Preston Quirk, architect for this project. Uh, my client, Jonathan Helm, is here, and there are two neighborhood representatives, uh, Martha Stinson and Michael Morosi. And we have talked. Um, I'm ignoring my notes that I was going to say at this meeting. And uh, we met out in the hallway. This thing, um, we, we were on consent agenda until I heard about, I don't know, 1 or 2 o'clock yesterday that we weren't going to be or that the neighborhood had commented on it. Um, so we've met and talked, and we have a proposed alternate site plan to talk about while we're here. Um, and essentially what it involves is taking the outbuilding and turning it 90 degrees. Um, the difference would be, by doing that, um, I think we are limited to 700 square feet for the footprint. So by doing that, I can probably get it to 21 feet off of Fairfax. If it's about five feet off of the south property line, Fairfax is on the north. Um, we would be 10 feet off the alley. The one concession we would be asking for is that allowing the building to then be 10 feet off the back of the house instead of 20, which is the normal requirement. Um, but I guess we're, we're asking for that because we do have kind of a unique situation here where you have these lots that um, are unlike a lot of the blocks where you've got this row of lots that face Natchez, and as as Melissa commented, the back of this butts up to the side of Mr. Morosi's house. So um, we've talked about it. I think those two are in agreement, but they're welcome to come up here and say what they need to say. Um, is is my proposal clear of what I'm saying? And I 
think probably maybe routing the drawing around. I'm sorry that you didn't have anything more formal sooner, but um, <laughs> in the essence of time, we're trying to work it out. So um, I'm here to answer any other questions. Sure. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Clerk. Um, will the applicant like to say anything? Okay. We'll just hold that for a moment. Okay. Um, we'll open public hearing. Commissioner Bell, just pulling up order real quick. For yes, sir. Administrator. Um, I'm, I'm certainly open to seeing new information um, that has happened, but I, I know in the past we've, I don't I want to put this in a scenario. I think there's a workable situation that, that's being passed around here, but I don't want to put us in a position to um, have to accept that in future cases if um, we, if the staff has not had a chance to review it. I think because this one was on consent agenda, mm -hmm. we may have some discussion here that wouldn't um, cause the applicants to have to reappear if everyone was in agreement at the end of this. Uh, but I, I, I did want to ask the staff if that, if we're running up against, not, not in this particular situation, but in other situations, uh, something that would uh, allow, our, and it would be allowed in our rules of order. Yes, it really is pretty much the same design. It's just a matter of reorienting the building a little bit. And so I think, but I'll leave it up to you, but I think that's something that's easy enough for you all to visualize, plus you have the drawing. Um, so it's not really changing the design, but it is addressing the request of the neighborhood, as far as, far as I know so far. I'm good with it. I guess so, Commissioner, you were like, if it's new information, our protocol is, um, and I guess we've accepted those in the, if staff has had not, not had the chance to review it. We've made an exception. I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to point it out so that we're not willy-nilly getting sure. new information on, you know, every case that comes before us. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to put up roadblocks for this applicant or in this particular situation. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to clarify. Sure. Thank you. Duly noted. If I could add one quick comment just to reply to that, um, as you do many times, if we have changes like this that do result in any, you know, I, I expect the building will look a lot like it does now, but we will certainly redraw it, get it back to staff, and work with them on approval of it if, if this is approved. Okay, we will make that our part of our motion. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, yes. may I ask one quick question to the uh, architect? So by <laughs> turning, uh, because original proposal was garage was facing to the alley, so car moving going that way. By facing, so the cars now go in and out to existing driveway side, or how does it no, work? We would well, still, I think the proposal we would still access off the alley. That's access just, on the alley, okay. Yeah, that seems to be the best way to access it. So preserve Thank you. nice yard space for the. Okay. Wouldn't you have to have some kind of metro if you changed it to a, you know, a right away? I mean, instead of the alley. I mean, I think for clarity, I mean, the there, there is a. Yeah. This property does have a front load driveway yeah. off of Natchez Trace right now. Okay. It actually goes straight back and goes through the outbuilding that's there now. Um, but I think the the intent is to keep part of that drive. That driveway is actually a shared driveway between the two houses here. So that driver would re would remain, but this would just access off of the alley. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Morosi. I live at uh, 2529 Fairfax Avenue. Uh, as was established, uh, I have the, the house that is directly adjacent uh, to this outbuilding. So first, uh, you know, we have no issue with the proposed addition and, and the requested uh, setback variance as it relates to the addition. Uh, as it does relate to the, to the outbuilding, as uh, as Mr. Quirk uh, mentioned, uh, we would like to uphold the base zoning of the 20-foot setback uh, because, as you'll see on slide two that I circulated, uh, that is much more in keeping with the setbacks of the houses on Fairfax Avenue, which average about 40 feet. Uh, so uh, the the proposal that that Mr. Quirk advanced, where you know, the outbuilding remains kind of within the existing base zoning of a 20-foot setback. I personally find palatable as, as the next-door neighbor, uh, but, but any project uh, that, you know, that has the outbuilding, um, you know, kind of uh, extending beyond that, that 20 feet off of Fairfax Avenue, I would view that as being, you know, kind of not necessarily having grounds to, you know, to, to request that change to the, to, the, to the base zoning of the setback. Um, so... I think with that, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, we heard from 
uh, Tom Cash, uh, Martha, Martha Stinson of, of the Neighborhood Association is also here. Uh, I heard from owners of 12 houses on Fairfax Avenue that uh, uh, you know, are in agreement with, with my viewpoint that that the uh, that that 20 foot setback from Fairfax should be uh, should be preserved. So, thank okay. you very much. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Martha Stinson. I live at 2606 Westwood Avenue, and I'm here today to represent the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Association. I would just like to put forward um, that the board of the Neighborhood Association just thinks that the outbuilding would be moved too close to Fairfax. When you look at the context of Fairfax and the uh, historic fabric of that street, the historic buildings are set back 40 feet to put this new construction at 10 feet is just too close. Um, that is a very highly visible collector street, and it's in the heart of the historic district. So that would be a jarring sort of element that would vary greatly from the historic fabric that's well established. Also, since it is a new construction and a standalone building, there is the leniency, if you will, to place that building so that it does not violate the 20-foot requirement. The solution that Mr. Quirk has suggested is, is acceptable to, to us, and um, it would preserve the 20 feet along Fairfax, and the interior violation, if you will, of the closeness of the outbuilding to the um, residents in this context seems appropriate to us. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your service and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Denson. We appreciate you waiting. Anyone else for public hearing? I would add, I, I'm a neighbor, David Anthony, at 2513, further down the street, and it sounds like this is an acceptable resolution. I was, I'm a lawyer, so I have to speak out loud whenever I have the opportunity, if you don't mind. <laughs> sure. But, <laughs> My concern and what got me sitting here in these pews, I hope you guys get paid for this. <laughs> this is, but, but that alley, the way it comes out, Fairfax, I've lived there for the past 12 years. It's a busy street, mm -hmm. and it's getting busier because people go from West End to, to 21st and vice versa. And that alley is a sharp turn because you've got people coming off of Natchez. And they're in a hurry to get to 21st. And so this is the first entry point, and to put a structure there 10 feet closer to Fairfax would create a, a, a just a blind spot. And so it sounds like this resolution is acceptable to, to the immediate neighbor, and it satisfies my concern as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you waiting. Anyone else in public? If not, I will close public hearing. Okay. I was, um, well, I want to just applaud <clears throat> the applicant and the um, and the neighborhood association and neighbors for just collaborating on this together. I um, am in agreement that the setback needs to be held at the 20 feet. I drive the street often, and when you hit that intersection, it is just compressed all of a sudden, just with the house even being placed where it is with a reduced setback compared to the, um, the houses that are facing the other direction on Fairfax. So, um, uh, I am in agreement that that setback for the uh, outbeat building needs to be held at the 20. Um, because it is a corner lot and it does present that hardship, I, th I think that presents a hardship and the house is already placed, the side of the house is placed closer to, to Fairfax. I, th I think allowing that rotation and um, reducing the requirement from the house to the outbuilding does seem appropriate to me. And... Um, those are just my thoughts, but again, I just want to applaud the, the collaboration that just happened here. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think a clarifying question to our legal or Robin, because by turning the house to this way, now we are uh, have to accept uh, the modification from a setback from back of the house to a building, which require 20 feet, but it will be now reduced to 10 feet. But that modification is in our purview, and I think 
uh, we did accept those differences in the past. So I just want to make sure uh, we have authorization to accept that change. You do, especially when you consider that it, the space between the buildings isn't really a setback issue. Um, the 20 foot off the side is a bulk standard setback. So they're kind of different things. So reducing the 10 feet to 10 feet is just a design guideline, not a, a setback determination. Uh, Commissioner Bell, because of the, I guess, urgent nature uh, of uh, Mr. Quirk's <laughs> de dealing to, to, to make something uh, that's workable here, just in, in terms of looking at the setback, I would um, offer that the, uh, you know, if, if in looking at this and the final presentation of the drawings, it, it makes sense or it's workable that the, um, the garage door can face the alley or can face Fairfax, I, I think based on the, you know, the size of the garage, or the, the size of the garage or the size of the, the opening and whether that works, you know, you can fit two cars in 21 feet or, or not, just to allow that option um, if, if we decide to approve this. That the architect could could do it could do either um, just given you know how, how the car movements and all those things work I, I find that this solution satisfies all parties and would be willing to reduce the distance between the house and the um, and the outbuilding given the constraints uh, and and the specific site constraints of, of this application. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else? Pretty clear. Okay, does anybody want to make the motion? Uh, Madam Chair, when, uh, with respect to 2000 Natchez Trace, I applaud the efforts of the uh, Neighbors Homeowner Association applicant architect in finding a solution for this. And uh, I agree with Mr. Mosley's uh, recommendations for uh, options available as far as the orientation of the garage door but make a motion that we approve uh, this project uh, with staff conditions and that we also grant uh, the reduction of the distance, required distance from the house to the outbuilding from 20 feet to 10 feet. And maintain the 20 foot bulk. And, and main, maintain the 20 foot uh, buffer uh, setback from Fairfax. Okay. There is a good motion on the table. Second. There is a second by Commissioner. Uh, Price, all in favor of the motion? Okay. Any opposed? None opposed. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I think. Do we have anything else, Ms. Ziegler? Nothing else? Okay. All right. Well. We are done. Thank you, everyone, and appreciate your time and energies and staff. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.